Welcome to Staring into the Abyss. I'm your host, Richard Gerlach. With me, as always, is Villamay Mist. Hey, yo! Unfortunately, um, Matt got displaced into a quarantine chamber when he's been diagnosed with a severe case of rabies and has been oh, losing no. his teeth. So Matt is unavailable to be here today, but in his place <laughs> is the author of Transmuted, Eve Harms. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for joining us. We're really excited to have you here. Like, Yay. Transmuted was one of my favorite from the Rewander Die books that I've read. So oh, thank you. It's, 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 it's a lot of goopy fun. I think the best way yes. to put it up there. Isn't we body have, horror uh, always goopy? <laughs> we do love the goop. <laughs> yes. Body, body horror tends to be very goopy. Very goopy. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome... Thank you for joining us today on Abyss, and Thank we're going to be oh, no problem at all. It's our it's our pleasure, honestly. Yeah. And well, today we're going to be discussing the novella Low Kill Shelter, and the author it says it's Propentine Charity Heartscape. I think it's Porpentine. Porpentine. Thank you. Yeah. Porpentine yeah. Charity Heartscape, and she um did um. The book, which is kind of like a bizarro sci-fi with like a teeny bit of horror called Psycho Nymph Exile, which is really, really good as well. Okay. And she's kind of kind of got like a cult following and yeah, her work's really good. So I'm excited. I know like s certain corners of the indie horror community haven't really heard about her stuff. So I'm excited to talk about it. I've honestly never heard of her, but this book, like I want to read more of her after reading this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and Psycho Nymph Exile, that's like top tier title. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's right up there with Say Cheese and Die. Like, it's just so good. <laughs> I, I just, I want to read it. And I did, and it's good. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, I'm definitely looking forward to checking that out. And for our audience here, before we even get into the discussion, Low Kill Shelter, look it up on Amazon. Or it's also, um, you can get it from the author. I think she has it listed on her website. I know it's also like an e.io website you can get the ebook from. Um, I got it off of Amazon for like two bucks for my Kindle. And yeah, it's cheap. It's great. Pick it up, read a copy, and help spread the word of this author around. And before we get before we get into it, we like to kind of give a weekly roundup of media we've consumed. And so as the audience <laughs> Might know, I am starting a new podcast with Matt Brandenburg that should be going live soon called um, Nacho Dad's Movies, where we discuss 80s and 90s action movies. And part of that was we rewatched uh, Starship Troopers this last week. Oh, I love that. And awesome. Love that, that movie. Is a lot of fun and really fucked up when you like break a lot of that movie down. Um, That's true. It's, it has so much. It has so much. I've never read the book, but the movie is fucking, it's, it's hilarious. It's like. It's like commentary and then there's like a sci-fi and, you know, there's gore. There's a lot of disgusting books. There's the cow scene. <laughs> I've, I've heard that the book is like, is like serious and it's like almost a satire on the book itself. Yeah, I've never, I've honestly never read Heinlein, but like it wouldn't surprise me if the book was like a bit more serious than the than the movie is, or maybe with the book being serious, that could be a type of commentary in itself. That could be something I would probably dive into and look at. But the movie is definitely a parody of like fascism. It's like, yeah. hey, fascism is terrible, and here's a fascist society, and we're all gonna laugh at it because all these people are fucking idiots. Yep. Um, Michael Ironside, though, is great in the movie. <laughs> yeah, he is awesome. <laughs> He's always awesome. Yeah, every time I see yeah. Michael Ironside in something, I'm always I'm always really happy. And then a Clancy Brown's pretty great in it too. Is it still fun and funny that Neil Patrick Harris is in it? Oh, this is not bad. Was Neil Patrick Harris like shortly after Doogie Howser was over? Yeah. Post Doogie Howser, Neil Patrick Harris. And he's decked out in a full SS uniform by the end of the movie. Yep. yep. Well, um, after after Dookie Hauser, I think he starred in uh, like a really uh, short uh, TV series called Stark Raving Mad. 
I don't know. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but uh, oh, mm. what what's his name? Um, the one who played Monk. Oh, I don't I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one who played <laughs> Monk was also in it, and he was playing, I think, this uh, like this uh, rec- like a reclusive writer or something like that. And Neil Patrick Harris, he played his like agent or his lawyer or something, and it like it it went into weird shit there. I don't I don't know how long it lasted, but I remember watching it. There's no like, wait, I know you. This is Dookie Hauser, isn't it? Even though we didn't have Dookie Hauser in Iceland. But Dookie Hauser is worldwide. Like every, everyone sees Neil Patrick Harris and the first thing they think is Dookie. Yeah. Even all well, these years later. Well, actually, I think in Iceland, people are going to think of him as the guy from the um, How I Met Your Mother first. Oh, yeah, that's true. How I Met Your Mother kind of blew up. I forgot. I honestly, ever since that show ended, I kind of forgot about it. Yeah, because it's it's forgettable. It's a piece of shit. <laughs> Never seen that. <laughs> it had my moments. point taken. It had its moments when it was on the air, but it's kind of like your average sitcom. Yeah. If you, if was, you don't like sitcoms, you're not gonna like it. No, it's like it was trying a little bit too much to be friends, but failed miserably. Oh, you can only, you can only failing at being friends is is uh, not a good look. No, it's not. <laughs> But uh, I, I am, I am happy to say that Starship Troopers holds up really well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's still fun to watch. And the CG, for the most part, is pretty good. There's a couple rough spots, but overall, like, I was kind of impressed at how well the, most of the CG held up. I still remember. I still cringe at the brain scene. Uh, yeah, <laughs> they sucked out his brains. Yep. It was so nasty and the slurping noises. I was like, God, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, but besides that, I have also finished an audiobook, which is, again, listeners of the podcast know, I've been on a big Barry Eisler kick recently, and I finished his book called The God's Eye View, which, like, he's kind of a really, really good thriller writer. Like, his books are solid thrillers, they can get pretty fucked up at points. Like his Livia alone series. I'd pretty much say like if Jack Ketchum wrote a straight thriller novel, Olivia alone would be like what Jack Ketchum would write. Like it, it gets pretty dark and fucked up, hmm. but God's side view is interesting because it's kind of like, it's about this. It's about the NSA who has gained a program. They call God's eye view, which allows them to hack every camera in the world to see and pinpoint where people are and to like keep location data on people and everyone who's going to try to leak this to the press mysteriously dies and it follows a woman who comes across this conspiracy and is fearing for her life because now that she knows and her boss knows she knows her boss is sending people to kill her and it kind of follows her and this man named Marvin Manis, who is a deaf assassin, and how he betrays his boss to protect this woman. And it kind of follows this like big espionage hole as it goes down. It's a really intense thriller. And if you enjoy thrillers, I would highly recommend it. And last thing for me would be I just started a meat photo by C.V. Hunt and Anderson Prittney. And if you like schlock horror that's heavy on the schlock, <laughs> recommend. I'm only 32% through, and it is some of the most fucked up and funny shit I've read in a long time. The concept is pretty much uh, people are getting obsessed over this photo they've come across of meat. And some people have been stapling this photo to their face. And then it drives them to go out and commit acts of violence and murder. (laughs) And that's a great premise. Yeah, it's 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 hilarious. Like there was there was a line of the book I had to highlight. So I highlighted a couple lines, but like one death scene in the book had me laughing my ass off. But it's pretty early on. So um, (laughs) it was pretty much. The the joke of the character is the guy's name is Richard Johnson, and he's like, and my parents used to call me Dick Dicker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, took me a second. <laughs> oh, 
okay, I can I can already tell that this is gonna be a really like a laugh out loud kind of horror book. Yeah, I feel like it um it kind of fits in. There's almost like a genre of horror films where it's like you see something Skype and it makes you <laughs> become <laughs> uncontrollably beast, whatever, like um yeah, like bird box or something. I feel like it's a very internet age thing where like we're exposing ourselves to these like feeds of all yeah. this like crazy stuff and then like it makes us feel these feelings we like don't want. So, yeah. I, I like that kind of stuff a lot. So um before before my Skype crashed on me, which usually only happens once, but this time it's happened twice. So hopefully two times the charm. But um the gar- the character is Richard Johnson and his whole thing is he has a great looking dick that he posts to OnlyFans. Oh my god. Around with photos of me. And the whole beginning part of his chapter is just like describing him taking his photos of his dick with all the meat around it and stuff. And um <laughs> okay. Then the last well, paragraph I, I can I, sorry, I just suddenly had this real fucked up image of Nico Avocado doing the same <laughs> fucking thing at some point see, in his would, life. Pass Nico Avocado if he'd do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this this is this is the end of that chapter as well as Richard Johnson's death. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. A smallish and overweight woman stood to his left, wearing a pretty tasteful shot of meat on her face, even though it wasn't one of Richard's photos, and she held an enormous peat of meat by the bone protruding from it. Richard didn't have the time to react as the woman lifted the meat and brought it crashing down on his head. But his last thought was, please don't hurt my beautiful cock. <laughs> oh, <okay. Yeah. laughs> like, it's, it's a really schlocky, really funny book. And so far, I definitely recommend it. But I'll have a full review by next week because I'm pretty sure... I'm finishing it tonight once we're done with the podcast. But Vitlame, what about you? Well, I I haven't actually been reading anything at all except for the book that we're covering today. Um, but uh, I did, uh, my husband and I did finish um, The Legend of Vox Machina yesterday. I need to start that show. I hear it's really good. It's so good. It's so, so good. They just, they almost go all the way through with you know just you know they say fuck everywhere and i love that and they also show s- sex which is weird because it's an animation and uh, at one point grok i don't know if you if you watch critical role or know what legend of mark and i uh, watch mark and i is grok is this uh, ha- like barbarian guy and at one point he like dives into like a pool of acid and he takes off all of his clothes and i'm like well, I mean, you've shown us his butt, but you know, you've shown tits and you've shown you've shown sex in it. So why aren't you showing his dick? <laughs> and then I was like, not that I want to see his dick, but you know, you, if you want to go all the way through, you need to you need to follow through. Sure about that, Villame? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> He's a funny guy. There's certainly I mean, a double standard. There is yeah. a double standard. Yeah. So I was like, eh. Kind of, uh, that thing, because maybe it's a little bit of nitpick, but you know, every the rest, the story is really fantastic. The characters are awesome, and I really can't wait for season two. Oh, we season. Well, is it the same animation studio behind Invincible that does Vox Machina? I think so. Yeah, Titmouse. Well, hopefully, that's a great name for an animation studio. I know. <laughs> well, hopefully, they can get both like Invincible season two and Vox Machina season two out soon. There is. Well, I mean, when Amazon bought the animation rights, uh, they bought for like 24 episodes and season one was 12 episodes. So it's guaranteed there's going to be a season two. Yeah. And that's going to be an, a whole different arc. Like this whole season was one arc and, uh, like of the campaign that the Critical Role people were playing. So this uh, season two is going to be a new, new arc. So I'm excited. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, Eve, what about you? Any recommendations from this last week? Um, so we just finished watching um, Raised by Wolves. Have Have you two watched that one at all? I've yeah. seen the first season, but not the second season. I haven't heard oh, of oh, it. The second season's really good. It's a little different. But yeah, basically it's like second season goes way more into the horror territory. Though still Ooh. firmly in very weird sci-fi. But I just love the combination of like 
spirituality and sci-fi and mythology, like kind of like no matter how technologically advanced humans are, they still these kind of very human urges that you just can't get rid of to mythologize things. Is, um, is it on HBO Max or? It is yeah. HBO Max. It's, it's a Max exclusive. Oh, I see, I see. Yes. I need to check it out. Um, and if you like um, Android milk, there's a lot of Android milk. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, and you're like, yum, yum, yum. yum. It's that just Ridley like a- Scott um, Android. What's with his deal? And the, yeah, he has this real fetish for that. Oh, he's not alone. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, throughout his uh, space movies, he's had a few different scenes of uh, Android milk. Yeah. So, so I, I guess mean, that's his thing, I guess. So, you know, obviously. Tarantino has his feet, Ridley has his uh, Android <laughs> milk. <laughs> I, I would like to see them combined somehow, like oh, some Lord. Android milk on the feet. Mm, ew. What about feed Android milk? Yeah. Or Android feet milk? I think it'd be available. Yeah. I mean, it must go into the feet. Um, it's it's like their blood, right? Yeah. Like I, I remember the first time I saw Alien, and I got so grossed out at like Bishop's milk scene. Yep. And like it was. Yeah. <laughs> that was the one thing in that movie that grossed me out more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Was that one scene? It's kind of interesting too, because it's like that's like supposed to be the a robot, right? You're not supposed mm-hmm. to feel for the robot, and it's like mm-hmm. the most disgusting scene. Yeah, yeah. But it's so it, funny. Also, um, the symbolism behind his death. Uh, you know, a lot of people. Uh, if I think I heard about it, if you're taking like uh, cinema, like cinema studies or something at school, and they are watching the aliens movie, and they pause at that specific scene where the alien queen is killing Bishop. It's supposed to be Queen Takes Bishop, like in a chest. Oh, oh. There you go. Yeah. I don't know if it was intentional, but it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Usually the Queen in chest doesn't do it so brutally, but yeah, I get it. Yeah, no, I, honestly, I really like the, I mean, I think Ridley Scott's a really great director. So I need to, I've always, I still haven't seen his new one that's on HBO right now. One that's like Rashomon, but in like France during the Crusades. Wow. Oh. I, I, cool. Yeah, it's like it's like the same story told from like the point of view of four different knights. So it's kind of like Rashomon, but like not. I say, why don't we just dive into a low kill shelter and talk about how bananas this uh, story is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Which um, I know you you kind of talked about why you picked this this story at the end of the podcast. Why this one instead of the um. What was her other one that you mentioned? Um, Psycho Nymph Exile. Yeah, why why'd you choose this over Psycho Nymph Exile? That one's like a little less horror. And then also, you know, it's nice to have an excuse to read something new, I guess. And this uh, is very much of the moment. I mean, it's like a, it's a pandemic story. Yep. Um, yeah. That I don't think I would have been able to handle like <laughs> six months ago even or a year ago. So I, I think it's time. For people to read low kill shelter. Yeah, once you once you feel like you're getting out of the pandemic, low kill shoulder comes and drags you right back in. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's time to read it. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it really does. But no, this is this is a really wild book. Pretty much for those in our audience, if you haven't picked up low kill shoulder yet and you're curious to what it's about, the best way I can describe it without getting into spoilers is it follows a man named um, Iran and his friend Jesse. And they have survived a pandemic that deals with uh, rabies instead of COVID. Yeah. And these is a form of rabies that is probably worse than what you would have found in Survivor Song by Paul Tremblay, which is another pandemic novel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And it does some fucked up shit to the people. And we kind of see how pandemic, the pandemic has changed people's mindsets, mm-hmm. affected people, and also the curiosity about this form of rabies and how it's kind of changed people as well. Mm-hmm. As we explore right. like Iran's past, the present, and as well as uh, his relationship with Jesse. Yeah. Uh, so. And uh, not only with Jesse, but also with other people. I think I'll show well, that. 
Yeah, with other people too. I just kind of see Iran and Jesse are the two like main focus, but then there's also the people around Iran in his life as well. Mm-hmm. And I think a big part of it is also um, Iran is autistic. Yeah. Um, yes. And so it's him also just exploring his relationship to people who aren't autistic as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I think it's it's a really interesting book because, um, you know, it's it's it makes people go rabid, but it actually kind of turns them into like a dog almost. It's often mm-hmm. referred to as dogs. Like people yeah. kind of start crawling on four legs, and then a big part of it is is the teeth. Yeah, uh, they, they lose their teeth, fall and out, they, get replaced, like fang, like dog fang type teeth. Yes, like it, like it kind of like is a razor mouth with you know, which your mouth or your lips can't really cover, and I think that was the most horrifying part about it. Oh, when they describe the smile after they've lost the teeth is so creepy. Yep, uh, it's like I, anything I, anything with teeth, I just it's immediate. Like, oh, I can't. I have this thing we, with teeth. <laughs> is that what you chose, dear Laura, for us to discuss, Vit Lemay? Is it what now? Is is that what you chose, dear Laura, for us to discuss? Yeah. When you came on as the guest, your teeth thing? Yes. <laughs> because it still sits yeah. in me, and I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, I'm like, I don't know if you saw, uh, like, it was on Twitter, uh, someone posted, like, the things that, uh, which countries, what they dream of the most. Yes. Yes, and, I saw that. Yeah, I was going to mention yeah. that, too. And, uh you know, and I—I I don't know. I can't. T- I can't speak for everyone, but in I- this, it said that in Iceland, a lot of people dreamt of snow, and I'm like, no, that doesn't sound right. I asked a co- like a, a couple of coworkers. I'm like, do you guys have you ever dreamed of snow? And they're like, no. I dream of be- beaches and sun. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that sounds about right. And then I failed to mention like I actually dream a lot about my teeth falling out. So I, it, it might kind of drive the home the like my nagging suspicion that I might have been adopted, <laughs> and then maybe in the states or the UK because they had a lot of those like people dreaming teeth falling out. Yeah, so like all of ne- North America was marked with teeth falling out as mm-hmm. um. So the the headline <laughs> on that graphic was a little misleading because it's not the most common dream. It's like the most commonly Googled dream oh, so that makes sense and, yeah so it's like the one that people are most interested in de- decoding sort of so be, I, yeah. I don't the snow thing i don't know but um i mean so yeah, yeah like, the, i think that makes a whole lot more sense because you would yeah. you know you would really be like really want to find out what the fuck is happening in your head if you're dreaming that and i've seen like people say you know like dream interpretation it's kind of you know it's obviously not scientific at all but i think i've heard a lot about like loss of control or like that it's like an mm-hmm. omen that um someone's going to die or yeah. um or just i mean generally obviously it's an anxiety dream yeah most definitely i usually get them like and they're usually so vivid like i actually dream the pain <laughs> And, you know, waking up to this tame pain is not a good thing. <laughs> You're mm. not going to have a good time, basically. Yeah, and, and loss of control is, like, such a huge theme in this this book as well. Yeah. Um, like, the, the people who get the disease, they lose control. I don't think they actually ever mentioned the name of the, the disease, actually. They don't. Um, I, I don't think Porpentine, she ever mentions the name of the disease. Um, well, she just describes it as rabies, you know. Yeah, I guess people like refer to it as rabies. Yeah. Advanced rabies. Very advanced. Rabies, rabies <laughs> too, the electric boogaloo. Like super rabies. Yeah. Super rabies. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really interesting because it's kind of like goes back to like this animalistic, this kind of like that, you know, we're all animals when it comes down to it. And I think one thing that's happened with the pandemic and then also just um, with the rise of kind of more um, right wing ideals is that people not as much in that world are kind of becoming surprised by people's behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a kind of like implicit cultural um, norm that people think is kind of just a natural human behavior. But in the reality, it's like a it's really just a layer that we've developed that people have become accustomed to. And in the end, we're all animals. It's not, there's no guarantee that like the way we're supposed to behave is always going to go like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I found that really interesting because the character is autistic and talks about how they need to decode, like they have to like, and I've heard this from other autistic people too, where they have to kind of manually decode 
human behavior to understand it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like the rules that are all implicit in these like kind of cultural contexts that um, people who aren't autistic generally just kind of soak in by um, association are something that this character has built up. Mm -hmm. And in a way it kind of makes the character more prepared to deal with this um, because he, he kind of sees like, you know, he sees it as a project, and I found that really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it's like he sees that we're we're animals with all these, like, extra stuff that we put on ourselves, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I thought it was really, really cool um, way to explore that theme. I just really like the fact that she managed to nail autism so well. It was, yeah. like, really, really good. Uh, I recently just finished um, Drowning in the Deep. Uh, by Mira Grant, and there's a and there is this uh, character who is supposed to be autistic, but I don't think she did that good of a job of portraying that. I think it was portrayed mm -hmm. better in in this book than it was in Drowning in the Deep. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I, it's it's not from, just me. From someone who's read both, I think like this one definitely, especially with like focusing on Iran and how he's trying to understand people and decode their behaviors and understand like yeah. What's going on felt a lot more, and, and, so and not just and not just that. It's also he's trying to, you know, cope with his own feelings, but at the same time, yeah. he, he he doesn't know how to process it, so he always comp comp compartmentalize. That's a yeah. hard word. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And uh, yeah, and you see how it in the end, like he just kind of unravels. Yeah, and like I think like it's also a bit more sympathetic than how it's done in Drowning in the Deep as well. Oh yeah, oh yeah, much Remo better. Like I said, this is not done way way better. Yeah, no, I, I'd agree with that hundred percent. And also, I like it's also enduring the relationship like Iran holds with his friend Jesse throughout the novel too. It was so sweet. It's a really like I don't know. I I, I thought it was a really sweet dynamic the two of them had together. Yeah, I thought it was really sweet. It's like, at first you're like, oh, you're doing it for a friend. And then it, you know, grows into something more deeper. And you're like, oh, you sweet little thing. <laughs> Who has rabies? Uh, you have rabies. Yeah, it's interesting. You have rabies. <laughs> it's like, who's my little rabies baby? Well, I mean, he kind of like had that kind of like thought to Jesse at the time. He kind of referred yeah. to him like a like a pet. It's like, yeah. uh, he, it's just kind of like, huh. So this is what it feels like to have a pet. And you're like, yeah, yeah you get it. <laughs> yeah, only your pet is a human with an immense form of rabies. Yep. <laughs> but then it, then again, it changes into something way different than that, too. Yeah, it really as, does. As yeah. the book continues. I, I, I honestly did not expect that ending. <laughs> oh, the ending, like, that was like when I, like, that hit me. Like, the end yeah. ending. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Can we talk about it? Uh... We can we can dive into spoilers and then talk about the book in a wider sense. Yeah. So for our audience okay. at home, like if you don't want the rest to be spoiled for you or big plot points to be spoiled for you, we all highly recommend you check this book out. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't it only costs you like a cup of coffee, man. It definitely is yeah. worth it. It's it's a really cheap it's a really cheap ebook on uh, Amazon. You can also if you go to the author's website which I'll plug here too. I believe it is, it is slimedaughter.com. Yeah. And you can also pick up her stuff from her website as well. And why don't we just dive and in? It, and it's not long. So. Yeah, this one's like 85. 83, pages, yeah, 83 pages or something. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a it's, good, fast read. It is. But that ending. Oof. Oh my gosh. So like, okay, so for whatever reason, like, so there's the, the climax where they're tearing apart the dude mm -hmm. and like that was like okay that that happened like okay yeah, cool. that, like, I, I kind of yeah something. We, yeah we, you kind of expected that I'll pause real quick and i just want to appreciate if you on the kindle if you go to the table of contents for some reason the chapter titles don't pop up in the text but they're listed in um the table of contents on the kindle oh i missed and that the um when we first meet the character nelson the chapter is called Full Nelson, and the climax <laughs> chapter is called Half Nelson. Oh my god! Oh my god! That is so good. <laughs> That's so brilliant. <laughs> and I did not see that. I have, I have, a, I have like a ancient Kindle, so that might be that might be why. Yeah. So um, 
Yeah, but like, well, well, also even before that, like, we should we should also backtrack to let people like Iran gets bit from Jesse. Oh yeah, and mm-hmm. he does it on he does. I mean, he kind of like gets bit on purpose. He's been curious about it, mm-hmm. and it just kind of happens. And then um, yeah, I mean, he doesn't struggle. He just like, oh shit, I got bit, and then he just kind of just like lets him bit him and then pushes him away. I'm like, oh, okay, I gotta clean it to see if anything happens. Yep, and then uh, this part is near the end after he's been bit, and Nelson comes over, and that was very unexpected. Yeah, and for the for the listeners, Nelson is actually a coworker of both Iran and Jess, uh, and he is actually he's moved into uh, Iran's apartment apartment complex, and he kind of has this feeling, and he or I think he saw Iran steal some of the equipment. At work, where I I assume he probably works at CDC, kind of felt like from the description it was really vague. But I was like, I got the feeling like, yeah, you work at CDC. I mean, that makes sense when you are you know researching this kind of weird pandemic, this weird incur- incurable disease. And uh, he saw Iran steal this equipment for him to use, you know, to try to find a cure for Jess. And yeah, he kind of confronts him about it, and that's when. He gets a health Nelson. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then after the the climax, when they've both kind of turned into, so they're kind of like half rabid dog people, though, because he's <laughs> since invented, like, a not a cure, but like a treatment that makes you kind of like, you still have all the issues. Yeah, it's like, it, yeah, it, but it, you it, can, but you're conscious and you're, yeah, you're human yeah, again. Yeah, you're like, you're cognitive, you know what you've gone through. But you still have the the the, the, the how do you say it, the outer symptoms, right? And and you still have the the appetite for eating raw flesh. Yeah, eating your <laughs> um, face like he always says. Eating faces. Yeah, I, I, love, I love they joke about it after they do it too. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. they do. It's like I have so, a half yeah, piece they, here. Do you want it? Yeah, I think yeah, like, that was crazy. Like, like, don't eat the liver. He's an yeah. alcoholic. Like, yeah. Oh. I liked where um, he just goes like, "You bit off more than you could chew, Nelson." Yeah, right. yeah, and then he laughs, yeah. <laughs> and you're like, "Hey, you made a joke." So that scene was like disturbing, right? Like, and in a way, I would expect though. Yeah. And then, like, is like the scene after the climax, which I actually thought the book was over. Then I thought that was the end of the book, because mm-hmm. uh, that'd be a fine ending. It'd be a pretty good ending. Yeah. But after that, it's like them, like a little bit in the future, and they're just like laughing at brunch. And it was like, that just like hit me. I was just like, mm-hmm. holy shit. Like they still have the rabies. They, they're they eating raw meat at, mm-hmm. at breakfast and they're enjoying the sun. And it was just like, I was like, oh shit, that's us right now. Like things have not gone away, but we're just mm-hmm. trying to get to this stage where things like, I don't know, it's a whole new normal thing, right? Yeah, kind of like doing, trying to do the normal thing, but at the same time, not. <laughs> Well, in their cases, they know they're spreading the disease. But, you know, here in our cases, we don't know if we're doing it. Right. Yeah. So, like they, right. They're doing everything they do on purpose. Yeah. Right. It's like, I don't know if uh, we, we don't get, we, of course, don't get to know Aran's or Jess's real intention. If it is they just really want to cause chaos or if they just really are lonely and just want to build a community of this or if they're trying to get like, you know, what we're doing right now, trying to achieve herd immunity. Um, we don't know. And that's also the scary part. So my interpretation is like this is actually like maybe six months or even longer into the future. Mm-hmm. And the cure or quote unquote treatment cure that um, Iran has created actually has been normalized in the community because they ordered like stuff that you you cannot get out of brunch place. Like they ordered like um like pink, basically just raw meat yeah. and in pink and like pink ice cream. Yeah. Um, so so my, my my kind of um interpretation was that like basically everybody's got it now. And like the the waiter saw them like spitting their blood into the cup, which before like would be a huge like they would have called someone to come kill them like take them out of their misery that's true now that you say it yeah so that's why it really hit me i was like oh shit like they they survived and now everybody is just like living this new like creepy reality but like you have to like you know 
This is having... hitting way harder now. Yeah. Like, I'm bumped out now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's also like... <laughs> Sorry. That's there... okay. <laughs> There's one part here, too, at the... I'm on the last chapter, where they're, they're still taking their doses. Because it's like... um. But here is... I think tells us a lot more than you'd expect is Iran works on the next dose date on a napkin. He's getting better at prolonging the effect, but they'll need to cook before the month is out and make extra this time because they're not the only ones keeping exotic animals. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, gets me chills. It's like, it's like a small little details like that, that kind of show us um, what's going on in society. But I love I love the um, last sentence where it's just when your teeth are very sharp, you need to be careful with all that lives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Porpentine, she has these like really she, she has like lines like that and just throughout her work that's just like really kind of poetic and impactful. Um, it was a really great ending word, like an ending sentence. Yeah, I mean this this book flies by. It's one of those books like once you start reading it, you kind of can't stop until you're done. Yeah, I mean I, you know, at the, at the very beginning, I still I felt this ominous feeling, and I, and it's no, and it's, a, it's really no offense to poor Iran's character, but I actually thought he was a serial killer because of the way he like how everything is just like described, and I'm like, shit, is he gonna kill someone? And then he's like, no, wait. <laughs> Uh, no, no, no. It's completely normal, but in a really fucked up way. Well, it's also like, I like the, um, how the book goes from between present and past. Yeah. Where, like, you kind of see, like, when the pandemic began and how this took off, like, when Jess disappears. Mm-hmm. And Iran gets, like, really worried about Jess and stuff. And then mm-hmm. when we see Jess, we're like, oh, that's what happened. And yeah. it creates this whole, like, bigger picture of, like, this society's been fucked for a very long time. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see it in when he, you know, uh, visits his sister and she's like, you know, just looks at him and like, ah, I don't have a boyfriend anymore. And you're like, wait, why? And he's like, I had to shoot him because he had rabies. And it's just, uh-huh. and it's just, he just does, she just does it like in a really, I don't know, it's like a normative way, I would say, but it's still impactful and sad. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's like small things that we learned too. Like I just went to a, a chapter that's near the climax and on the Kindle, it's called The First Smile. And that's when it has like the poem about like someone smiling in the mm-hmm. chapter. And like, again, there's just this whole little, little things here where it's uh, care is the way out. Care is death. Care is the way out. Care is death. Are you worth my time? My time has no value yet. I value it greatly. So maybe it does. It must. If medicine costs money and medicine comes from blood tests, bone marrow, stolen cells, stolen, and buying ourselves back in extruded, unnatural pill form, I've seen it all. Grounded, distilled, centrifuged, extracted, and that's kind of like as Iran's cleaning out his wounds. Yeah. In the other room. And the whole idea yeah, is... Yeah, like the fever's kind of taking hold. Yeah. And it's also, it's like, it just shows us that People are kind of their own downfall when it comes to like these situations too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you, you, I just, you I just, for these characters. Yeah, I just love it when the authors put little nuggets like this in their stories, and you manage to find them, and you're like, "Ooh, nice!" Again, this book's also it, like it moves fast, but it's kind of like a slow burn until that brutal death scene when they eat Nelson. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the thing. I felt like the first beginning like went by really fast, but once they um, and it, you kind of feel that's how she wanted to write it. Like it had to have this kind of sense of urgency of him, you know, trying to find a cure for his friend. And then when he finally, you know, feels like he has, it goes to a little bit of a slow and lets you feel around like how their life is going to be. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, this is I don't know. This whole this whole book just kind of like enthralled me the entire time, and the <laughs> world here is it could be expanded so much more, but I'm happy we have just a small snapshot of these characters. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I think I cut you off. Eve. I'm sorry about that. What were you gonna say? 
Oh, I was just going to say, like, it's definitely um, has that tension that we're kind of just experiencing where it's like there's this um, feeling of like danger around, but we're, we're still just kind of doing our boring everyday stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. you can definitely see that, you know, this world has, has gone through some shit and you and you see this kind of example when he, you know, brings beer to, you know, to his work and he kind of is, is you know, concealing it with creamer and Splenda. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. I like that part. And, you know, and when his, you know, manager, uh, which is uh, actually Jess's uh, girlfriend, right? Right. I think yeah. so, yeah. And she catches I mean, him. Formally, and she, I guess. Yeah, and she catches him and she's like, sniffs it. And she's like, wait, did you bring booze to work? And he's like, yeah. And she, and she tastes it like, what's, what, what does it have? Creamer and Splenta. And he's like, oh, that actually works in a fucked up way. And then she takes the cup and like, see you around. And it's like, nothing. Yeah. That was good. That was good. I thought I thought it was really good. I was like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you survived this pandemic, you and you and and they mentioned a lot of burnout, and I'm like, yep, yeah, that hits close to home as well. I mean, this is what people probably would do. I mean, this book was definitely written during the lockdown and quarantines that we've had over here too. Like, it's it feels so close to home. Mm -hmm. When did and, it come out again? Ah, uh, let me check that actually. Yeah. yeah, I think it was like six months ago or something. Oh shit! It's really recent. Yeah, it's it's a recent book. Um, yeah, it's 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 new. Let's see, low kill shelter. Did you look this up before we started? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I I feel like it definitely feels like a post vaccine. It came out book. September twenty eighth, twenty twenty one, according to Amazon. Oh, okay. So yes. yeah. That that does that's like that's where I that makes a lot of sense in terms yeah. of like what is trying to communicate well what I'm getting from uh, from it you know, mm -hmm. who knows what exactly the book is trying to communicate but it really feels like this really specific time reading the description for the first time actually and I love it it's like description when your best friend gets infected and wants to eat your face off and you work at a medical lab with his ex. And you still remember your family huddled around a pool of teeth on the floor. Horror novella about caregiving slash autism slash gay shit. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> love it. <laughs> I mean, it, I mean it, it is the most precise description of the book, if I'm being honest. Right. And like, well, we didn't even go over that. Like, they kind of get into a relationship. Um, yeah. yeah. Which, th there's this one scene, like, I almost missed it. Like, I guess Iran gets like a, like a sharp tooth bj or like at some point i was mm -hmm. like yeah he does not even like even really explicitly said it, but like you hear what happens after and you're like okay there's only that's the, the only thing that could have been happening right then mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I, I cannot interpret it any other way even though it was never said i still i also think you know at that time you also get a feeling for you know what Iran is really struggling. He, like, at the beginning of the story, you see that he is struggling with his uh, own person. He's not really sure of who he is. Yeah. And through the relationship with Jess, you, 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 you can see that his own, like, he's growing accustomed to who he really is. And uh, he's, you know, blossoming into that person. I really like that. Oh, totally. That's really interesting you said that, too, because I feel like... I don't know. I feel like actually like one of the few silver linings of the pandemic is that some people have been given like enough space and time to better explore who they are and like in mm -hmm. a little bit like an environment like away from, you know, like um, from the old the eyes. human interaction. Yeah, just from the old the staring eyes. Yeah. I feel like this pandemic has people have done a lot of self-reflection during the pandemic. Yeah, mm -hmm. like it's 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 made people re-examine their lives and like make them like think of like who they are. Are they actually doing this thing for the right reasons? It kind of made people question their career choices as well. Mm -hmm. Like it's yeah. it's done a lot for people. Like I know at least like a few people during the pandemic who have like been exploring their like sexuality or been exploring their gender and like becoming mm -hmm. like 
who they want to be and be like a truly happy person. Mm-hmm. It's one of, one of my best friends has been like recently came out as non-binary and is like exploring kind of like a um, feminine male like persona and, and like, like they've been feeling really happy about themselves and I'm really happy that they're kind of able to break free of the mold and be that person they want to be. That's great. That's feel, awesome. I feel like this uh, pandemic gave them the ability to like really kind of sit and reflect on their lives or reflect on themselves and like do will make them be happy. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. That's kind of my long little tangent, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. In, in, and in the story, you can definitely see that as well. I mean, uh, he, even though Iran was in a relationship with a woman named Nain, I think, wasn't it Nain? Uh, was it, is it spelled Nain? I think it was, I think it was like, uh, maybe it's, it's like N-A-I-N, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm not really sure how it's pronounced, but I kind of felt like it was like Nain or Nain. But uh, yeah, Nain they, sounds... yeah, Nain sounds, I think, correct, I hope. Yeah, we have a <laughs> book to go after, so we're doing our best. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, they had a relationship, but, you know, Iran didn't really feel comfortable in it. And uh, they broke off, but they still remain friends, which I find really nice. Yeah. And, you know, at the end, like near the end, you know, when he's still battling his fever after, you know, being bitten, he calls her. And it just, it, I thought, thought it was really like sweet and reassuring how he just, you know, just wants to talk. Just to get this kind of distraction from the fever and everything else. Yeah. yeah. Because he, knew, he, because he knew that even though he was comfortable being around Jess, he wouldn't probably get this kind of distraction from him. I can I can definitely agree with that. And I also think, too, with, like, kind of Iran, with his autism, has mm-hmm. seemed to be doing what he could to pass as, like, a normal human. Mm-hmm. And kind of do what's expected of, like, normal humans to do when not fully understanding them. Mm-hmm. And right. was unable to kind of embrace the person he felt he should be on the inside, which we know at the end of this book is not a, is not, like, a straight person. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of right. like exploring the relationship with Jesse or Jess, I should say, in the um in the story. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um I think it's referred to as masking. Um, and mm-hmm. I can yeah. definitely imagine when that's something you've come ac- so accustomed to doing in order just to survive and function. Like, it makes it much harder to. Um, I'm assuming it makes it harder to kind of explore your identity. I mean, you can see examples of that when he's masking, like uh, right at the, I mean, basically at the beginning of the first chapter, like where he says here, unvoiced laughter. That's it. Deeper in the throat, perfunctory clicking and grunting, controlled, brief, has a social use, fills the conversation, safer in every arena that exists. I mean, that's classic masking. Right. Yeah. I feel this is a book that rewards rereading. Mm-hmm. Where um, I think a lot of the books you can read them once, and then once you got the story and the ideas down, it's kind of like, oh, that was a really good book. I'd recommend it to people, but it's not something I could see myself getting a lot more out on a second or third read. Whereas I think this would actually reward repeat readings, so yes. you can kind of like see the character growth and see like the intricacies of the plot and the characters as this one progresses. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I think, um, I mean, I, I think this book is actually, because it's kind of like, this book is actually showing the strength of yeah. being mm-hmm. autistic. Yeah. Um, because he's able to survive probably better than almost anyone else, though he kind of makes the decision to not. But he's able to kind of, like, once our, you know, cultural, um, like, it's kind of like there's like a cultural breakdown over this mass event. And he's over, he's like, well, I already knew, you know. Mm-hmm. I already knew how the mask was constructed, right? Like you could argue we all we're all masking it, but but we're just not doing it intentionally, right? Mm-hmm. So he's kind of in this position where he kind of already knows how everything's built. So when it falls apart, it's kind of it's not as devastating to him because he doesn't see it as this is the objective truth of humanity. If that mm-hmm. makes any sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool. I mean, yeah, I love it when they do it, like, they portray it in a, I, w- I don't want to say positive way, but, you know, it's not in a negative way. 
You know what I mean? Right. It's neutral. Um, yeah, it's yeah. neutral. But you know, if we were if we're gonna bring out a really horrible example of negative view on autism, you just look no further than see us movie. Oh, I haven't mm -hmm. seen it. I haven't, and I don't want to. I just I heard horrible, horrible things about it. Yeah, I've I've heard the uh, controversies about the movie and seen pictures, and I feel if you're going to make a movie or a story that focuses around autism, mm -hmm. and you don't have the personal experience. Mm -hmm. You should really ask yourself, am I the right person to tell this story? Exactly. Right. And or, if you or, or, or if you really wanted to do this, at least have people tell you how it is that actually have this personal experience. Yeah. And like you can make it more like, hey, so my ideas are kind of fucked up and I was wrong. But mm -hmm. these people have kind of helped steer me in the right direction. Mm -hmm. but still, a lot of creative types don't like people telling them that their ideas are offensive or don't <laughs> like telling them that like they probably shouldn't do this thing that they want to do. I think and it's usually the people that have big egos. It is, but a lot of people tend to grow egos as as time moves on. True. As they as they get more successful, that tends to happen, yes. Like um this has nothing to do with like the story at hand, just a side tangent. I one of my cousins is also a horror writer and he's been like taking off of some middle grade stuff and he's always wanted to write middle grade fiction. So he's kind of like found his niche. I'm happy for him mm -hmm. talking. And he was like, he wanted to tell the story that dealt with race relations from the point of view of a Hispanic character. And this guy's like, a white dude from nah. South Massachusetts. No, 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 no. So I was like, you probably shouldn't be telling this story. And then I said, but if you feel like you really want to, you should hire some sensitivity readers or mm -hmm. someone who can be like, hey, this thing you're doing is a little bit fucked up and you might want to look at it on this other angle. And mm -hmm. then he was like, I don't want to hire somebody to tell me that my ideas are offensive, blah, 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 blah. I'm just not going to do it. And I'm like, all right, that's probably for the best then, if you're going to act like this towards the suggestion oh, of a gosh. sensitivity reader. Yeah. I just I mean, don't understand why he would want to do it in the first place if that's his attitude around it. It's very strange. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. He wanted, he wanted to make like this like positive race relations story. And like, I can't oh. appreciate the sentiment of it, but at the same time, it's like you need to think of the socio-political aspects of mm -hmm. how society is now, and yeah. you should best approach it because you can you can write like as, as a white author, you can write a race relation story that can be super positive or what you perceive to be super positive, but once it's out in the world. And the group of people, like, read the book that you wrote about them, and they see it as negative. You did nothing between writing and publishing it to help, like, change people's perspectives on it. Or, or even change your own perspective of how you're writing it. Mm -hmm. And when it's, in the world, it's out in the world, and you can't do anything about it. And, right. like, you really need to think, why should I tell this story? And if the answer is, like, I want to, that's not really a, a strong answer. Yeah, I mean, this it's is not. this is what this is what I thought also when I started writing my uh, horror western. I at first really because I enjoy Native, uh, Native American culture and folklore uh, that I wanted to have something like that as the uh, creature that was attacking the main character in the story. Well, but then, of course, the ghost story that Lame. Hmm? Were you going to write a Wendigo story? Yes. <laughs> because I really like that folklore, but at the same time, yeah, then I realized, like, no, this is not this is not something that I should write because this it doesn't include in my culture. Uh, and it's, you know, this is something even the Native Americans don't tell or anything like that. So I'm like, nope. 
uh, at first I was going to hire a sensitivity reader to see if it was possible. But then I realized like, no, wait, I have a shitload of stuff from Icelandic folklore. I can just put it in that instead. So oh, I'm yeah, using Icelandic that. folklore is awesome. Yeah. So yeah. I'm using that. I'm using uh, the hidden people. They are oh, going to be the creatures. Very cool. Yeah, so I was like, because, you know, Icelanders, they immigrated to the West during that time period. And, I mean, you know, it makes sense that some of those creatures came with them. Yeah, yeah, that sounds exciting. I'm really glad you didn't um, write a Wendigo story. No, um, I didn't. No, 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 I didn't. I was like, no, this is not my place. I, I was smart. <laughs> Well, it's time to make me look bad because I did write a Wendigo story back in <laughs> 17 that has not been published. Okay. And I've since edited it to remove the Wendigo aspect out of the story and made something different original to the story. I mean, that's you, okay. That's great yeah. that you um, well, have some self reflection. We love it. Exactly. Originally, it was a Wendigo story, and that was before, like, a lot of people were writing them and a lot of people were trying to like appropriate indigenous like folklore mm -hmm. culture. And after like more people started doing it and more indigenous people came out talking about it, I was like, yeah, I don't really feel like I did this for the best reasons. Mm -hmm. And then I went back and I edited around the story. I took out the Wendigo, made my own thing. And problem mm -hmm. solved. I feel like some people just, and this is me speaking, like, as good creative type, self-reflection, I think, can benefit our stories and benefit mm -hmm. our own writing. And Definitely. a lot of people can benefit from looking inside, which got a lot of which got into like a kind of a deeper conversation about a book about super rabies. But <laughs> true. Yeah. But I think it's good to recognize, you know, none of none of us are um autistic or on the autistic spe spectrum, correct? Just mm -hmm. I'm so, like, you know, we're we're coming out from an outsider's perspective. So we may have some blind spots when we talk about um, these characters. Um, yeah. But it's such such a good, it's just such a good book, and um, I think it's um, yeah. You don't have there's not a lot of books from from an autistic person's perspective. Mm -hmm. It has I'm, a really great portrayal of it, and I just I just want if people want to see, you know, how. A, a, an autistic person kind of functions because it's written in their point of view. You, they should definitely check it out. Well, it's like um, I'm going to embarrass Vit LeMay here too. Oh, crap! So you're you're welcome. Oh. In advance. Um, not okay. a lot of people deal like a decent people deal with like OCD. Mm -hmm. I think a lot sure. of people have like misconceptions of what OCD actually is, and like reading Vit LeMay's books really helped me understand a bit deeper like what it means to have OCD and kind of go through different episodes of OCD. And I think part of it deals with personal experience and personal knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's one thing, it's like there's a stereotype and then there's the reality. Mm -hmm. And people with experience can write up the reality of these things and make more effective stories. Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, I think it is important to remember um, that, you know, OCD, autism, um, I have bipolar 2 disorder, um, all sorts of things like this, you know, they're very real things, but they're also um, clinical terms, you know, created by doctors as ways to create a framework for treatment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there's all sorts of traits that will, you know, be shared between these different diagnoses. Like when I've had my highest anxiety, I have exhibited OCD-like symptoms, but mm -hmm. I don't have OCD because it's not, you know, it kind of like, it's kind of like all like a spectrum, like, like kind of mm -hmm. like a 3D spectrum where there's all these different kind of perspectives and ways you can encapsulate something and think about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, my and then like my whatever our mental... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Oh, sorry, I just just wanted to say, like, when you said it happens when you have an anxiety, that's usually my OCD kicks, like, into high gear when that happens, when I have anxiety. Yeah, exactly. So, like, there's often shared traits. Not, I mean, not always. There's no, like, hard, fast no. rule. But no, I, in I, the end, the, it's like... That's the thing. You, no one has the exact same thing. Yes. Yeah. That's a really good way to, to talk about it. So, it's interesting because... Mm -hmm. um. 
you know, you can kind of talk about this very specific thing, but in in reality, you know, and, and you really can group people, but in reality, we're all, we are all different. And when you're talking about a clinical diagnosis, it is, it's it's about how you know it comes down to this is something that's impairing your functioning and of course impairing your functioning quote unquote is like this is something that's an impairing how well you're fit into society mm-hmm. so it is kind of an interesting um it's good to kind of keep that in mind i think yeah. while still recognizing that these are very real challenges that people face and share mm-hmm. and speaking of you know having these kind of you know Everyone is different. You also see that in this story. There's oh, yeah. no one is completely the same in the story, and I love that. I love the diversity. Mm, that's true. Honestly, all these characters really left left off the page for me. They did, yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. And they were just short, it's just short introductions, but you're still like, oh, I know exactly who, what kind of character this is. And I can really appreciate. I can really appreciate the amount of work. That I must have taken to get these characters leap off the page, but it's also it's like with these characters, you you can feel for them and you can relate to them in different aspects of them, and you yeah. cheer for their victories. Or in this case, they're succumbing to uh, advanced rabies, mm-hmm. but like you also cheer for them finding a purpose and finding like their true selves. Yeah, you saw. You also like another example of that is when uh, when Jess meets uh, Drea. Yeah, you you completely saw that. You know, they were catching up, like you know, old high school buddy, like or they, they hooked up or something like that. And then you know, she try she's trying to hooking up again, but at the same time, you you see that she ha- she knows she has the rabies, and she's like, I just want to have this one last fun because before I lose my fucking brain, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you're like, you're like, yeah, I mean, a lot of people would do that. I think most people would do it. Yeah. And it's also, it's like this book, I feel partly collectively because we've been living through this pandemic, we can relate to a lot of the struggles these people are going through. Mm hmm. Like, um, you know, Nelson being an alcoholic. And I'm like, yep, makes sense. Yep. Well, it's also like, the, especially with like people near the end of this, when people kind of like, succumb and we get the hints that like more people have the virus like have the events rabies but they found ways to kind of treat it and for society to move along mm-hmm. and that's kind of like um i can't speak for every state or every country but like massachusetts for instance when the covid pandemic first like hit america we were hit really hard in the boston area mm-hmm I actually moved to Boston in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> oh. So, like, I picked the worst time to move. But right now we're at the point where, like, COVID cases are still happening, but, like, the mask mandates are over. Uh, the governor ended the school mask mandates at the end of last month. So, like, if you want to wear a mask in school, either a teacher or a student, you can, but it's no longer required to do so. It's the same here. In I- it's the same here in Iceland. We, uh, the government decided to um, uplift everything, like disband everything. You didn't. Ha- you don't have to wear a mask. You don't have to. You know. You don't have to uh, social distance. And even though you know we were getting about two thousand cases of infections a day, which is a lot yeah. when you consider that this little tiny island only has three hundred fifty thousand people. Yeah. And, and it was just like it was because you know at the end the um, the the main doctor I can't remember um, his, I'll just say his Icelandic name so you guys can try to pronounce it totally. Um, he just thought like it's just gone way beyond this and we just there's no way we can't you know our health infrastructure can't really handle this so we just have to uplift everything. It's, it was basically it was either close off everything and just go into lockdown, which would not work in such a tiny community like we have, or and just or just disband. And he was like, yeah, we'll just have to, we're, we're at this point, we have to live with this. And yeah. I mean, it's gone to the point where it's like, I have, I'm vaccinated, I'm boosted. Mm-hmm. And I'm at the point now, it's like, if I'm gonna get COVID, I'm, I'm gonna get COVID. Yeah. 
Like I've done everything on my end to to do the best I can to prevent it. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, like if I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it. It's gonna happen. And I've just yeah. like it's no, idea. it's no longer a matter of if, it's more when. Yeah. Well, I'm never gonna get it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you here? Where's the like, knock on wood here? Knock, 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 knock. I heard, I heard a study that um, CPD prevents it, so I'll, I'll rely on that. Perfect. Um, but yeah, it's it is. I mean, it's it's a really strange transitional time right now with the pandemic. Um, and I mean, yeah, I think almost everybody is kind of starting to say like hey i want to live my life and i still wear masks indoors and stuff but like i'm i am doing more stuff because i don't know like I, i'll go crazy if i don't yeah I, so. I, I i still wear masks when i go to the store i wear mm-hmm. masks and i say i wear masks when i go grocery shopping yeah yeah that's the same and like that's the main main store i wear masks in is like when i'm grocery shopping or if I see employees are masked up in the store, I'll put on a mask to respect the employees. Mm-hmm. Or if the store says like, we suggest we require masking, I'll I'll put a mask on. Yeah. So working a hospital, yeah. masked up all the time at work anyway. Oh, okay. Well, you're used to it then. <laughs> yeah, like I my my car literally every day we have to put a new face mask a new um mask on. So I have like twenty masks in my car just hanging out. <laughs> yeah, and we we I also have a lot of like there's just masks ready in the car if I need it. But yeah, I'm I'm surprised it took this long to talk about COVID when it comes to this novel or novella, I should say. <laughs> right. Because it's very clearly like the big inspiration behind this novel is like the pandemic, pandemic mindset, self discovery, and, and the aftermath. And yeah, and the and the and the succumbing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's a fun house mirror of our current moment. So I think this is a perfect time to read it, if you think you can handle it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I would say, I don't think, I, I think this book, like, it gets quite gory by the end. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I don't think it's it anything, does. like, super intense. I think most people can read this and relate to it and understand what's going on with it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to yeah, turn for subjects. sure. Yeah, it's it's like um yeah, just in terms of subject matter, I meant. Yeah. I mean, so, some people just cannot deal with anything like pandemic still. Is, yeah. is what it seems to be. Mm. I feel bad for the people who wrote pandemic novels before the pandemic happened. Yes. Yeah. And then the pandemic happens and their novels come out. And like that's the worst time. Yep. For that to happen. But I'm still, I mean, it's still, if they managed to do it, like, in a su- such a subtle way, like what Porpentine did, I, I mean, I think people will not hate it, you know? <laughs> it's oh, like, no. it's like with, the, you know, with Paul Tremblay's survival song. I mean, he, it dropped just before the t- pandemic, didn't it? It, it? He wrote it, he finished it before the pandemic. It came out mid-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so I mean, I feel bad for him because that probably hurt sales when it came out. Yeah, definitely. But you know, like I said, if they because I feel this is more you know because he created not the same flu type disease. You know, yeah, it's it's a completely different one. So well, I think you can a little bit do a little you know a little bit of escapism through that. Survivor song is about rabies too. Yeah, I I, I like Survivor song a lot actually. <laughs> But. I haven't gotten quite into it yet. I think I have it on my Audible. Need to check oh. it out. Like, it, like I said, it, like this. This was a nice short read, like because this is after the pandemic kind of thing. Yeah. So I might give Paul's read maybe a year or so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When you get to it, I think you'll enjoy it. It's really yeah. good. Only a book. I listened to the audio book too. I really liked it. Okay. Nice. I should check it out. I, I like Paul Tremblay, but I haven't I haven't checked out any, any of his newer stuff. Yeah, this one's pretty good. It's it's he wrote it because he was tired of being Mr. Ambiguous Horror. So oh, he yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. but yeah. I like that about his stuff. Yeah, this book doesn't doesn't have any amb- ambiguity about it. It's okay. um, it's still very literary, like a lot of his stuff is, but it's more just like pretty much the concept is 
our main character is in the middle of the rabies pandemic that's happening. And at the beginning of the story, she's bitten and her husband's killed. And her friend is trying to get her to a hospital for treatment before she succumbs to the rabies. And it becomes this like kind of like journey to see if they can get a cure for our protagonist. Got it. So it's it's a little bit a little bit different, but I think it's handled really well and I liked it a lot. Oh shit, I just realized I think my third book is a little bit like that too. Well fuck. Nothing you can do about that now. Nope, nothing I can do about that. I mean that, that's <laughs> how I designed my vampires, so <laughs> fuck it. I mean, well the thing is too, it's like, do we really have any like I mean I'd argue this story is quite original. But like if you get out of the bizarro state, because I think bizarro is just kind of its own thing on its own. Mm -hmm. Most stories, we've we're just borrowing or taking elements from different stories and kind of contextualizing them into our own work. Mm -hmm. Like there's very mm -hmm. few like fully original stories. Even like I just published a new short story a few weeks ago. I'm not going to use this to promote the story, but my grandparents finally read it. Which you know, my grandparents reading my horror stuff, not really the best audience for it. Um, <laughs> but my grandpa, my grandpa's comments to me was, so it's true. There aren't really any original stories anymore. And I was like, what do you mean? And he goes, your story was just the Maccabee story in the, from the Torah. And I was like, yeah, that was the inspiration for it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not going to deny it. Like, I'll be like, yeah, yeah. Man, that was the inspiration. Um, yeah, you always... What's there's nothing wrong with getting inspiration from other stuff. You're just we're just kind of like mm -hmm. taking things we've experienced or seen before and recontextualize them in our own way. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's how fiction storytelling's always been. Like people complain about movie remakes now. Shakespeare was remaking Greek plays back in like the 1700s. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 all storytelling at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Overall, we all agree that Low Kill Shelter should definitely be checked out. Oh yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Some reviews up. I would also kind of argue that this was actually been really good to like for, you know, high schools to read. Yeah, I could. I, could cool. I think. I think it's appropriate for a teenage audience. Yeah. I mean, I was reading Dude in high school, so I'm probably not the best really person to see what would be best for a teenage audience. But no, I can see. I mean, I, I mean, I read, you know, uh, what's it called again? Lord of the Flies in high school. So, yeah, I think they can take it. Yeah. I had to read Lord of the Flies in a class in high school. No, like, I think this is fine for teenagers. I think, mm -hmm. like, and I think teenagers can relate to a lot about what's happening in this story, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely think you should buy it, read it, leave a review. I know I'm going to. Mm -hmm. Me too. And make sure we just spread the word of this book around, because I feel like, this is an author who needs to be read and needs to be celebrated. And Absolutely. as the She's great. Down Woman in Horror Month, it would kind of be great to like shed light on some women in horror who don't really seem to be getting a lot of light shown on them right now. Mm -hmm. So this book gets two thumbs up from me. Yeah, same for me. <laughs> yes. And um, Great read. Oh, totally. And Eve, where can our listeners get in touch with you? Oh, yes. So I am on... Uh, most active on Twitter. Um, you went viral my, today. <laughs> yeah, I went viral today. <laughs> um, my my handle is Eve Harms Rights, and I also have that under Instagram as well. Uh, my website is eveharms.com. If you want to contact me, just do it through the um, form on my website. And yeah, I, I love to hear from people as long as it's not weird. Um, <laughs> which sometimes it is, but you know, like if you're just saying hi or have a business opportunity or like my work or whatever, feel free to, to get in touch. And my, yeah, my book that just came out, uh, in well, July is transmuted. So check that out as well. If you haven't already read it. Do you have anything else out or is it just transmuted? That's the main thing out right now. That's the main thing. Um, I do have a, um, I, I took down the individual books, but there is an omnibus in my series, The Demonic Diaries, which is like an epistolary novella series that I uh, put out myself. 
Um, so that is available if you really like my stuff. And I'm working on a bunch of other things, and I also make zines. So if you go to my website, eveharms.com slash zines, you can buy some. If you like zines, you can buy zines. They're not really horror, though. Um, I'm sure I'll do some horror stuff in the future with that medium, but it's, um, yeah, it's not horror, but maybe you'll like it anyways. Didn't you make a zine for your neighbor who was stealing your Amazon packages? Um, that they, they, it wasn't Amazon. A lot of people assumed it was Amazon for some reason, but, um, but yeah, I made a zine for my neighbor who, uh, stole my packages and you can buy that one if you want. It also <laughs> awesome. went that. Twitter is I having remember, a moment for me. I remember seeing that and I thought it was the funniest thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want one, get it while they're, they're still around. Perfect. And Vitlame, where can listeners get in touch with you? Uh, they can mainly get in touch with me via Twitter at uh, Vitlame S. Uh, I'm kind of like on a hiatus with my uh, booktube reviews uh, at Fang Pipsqueak Reads. Try, uh, we'll probably get something done during Easter, but th- at the moment I'm just too concentrated on writing my fourth book. So <laughs> I apologize if any of my uh, subscribers are listening. Uh, and I'm also on Book Talk at Vitlame Mist. Perfect. And you can follow me at Rudy5388. And also be sure to give uh, Staring into the Abyss a follow with at Into Staring. And you can also uh, rate and review us on our streaming platforms and help us spread the abyss around so we can consume all. And this is Richard Gerlach saying keep staring. Keep staring.